Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode marks the end of season one, but certainly not the end of this podcast. Plans for season two are already underway, and I'm very excited about some of the guests who've already signed on. But I won't be ready to release those episodes for a little while. So to make sure you're the first to know when they're available, please make sure you've signed up for the newsletter at howbrandsarebuilt.com. And between now and season two, we'll be posting new articles and information on the website. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook to make sure you're seeing the latest content. On this season one wrap up episode, I'm taking a look back at nine interviews with naming experts. I'll call out some comments I found especially interesting or informative. I've organized this episode loosely around the naming process, so let's start with the naming brief. Here's Jonathan Bell of Want describing what his firm includes on a naming brief, which he calls a blueprint. You know, there are three key parts to the blueprint. Number one is some kind of bullet point criteria for what you want the name to communicate. And some of those can be broad and general, like obviously it's got to be easy to say and talk about, but some of them can be a bit more uh, precise and perhaps a bit mundane. You know, if someone, if a client doesn't like the letter Z or X, you know, we can actually put that in the list of criteria. So that's the first part of the, the blueprint. The second part is... The name types, and obviously in my TED talk, I talked about the seven different fundamental name types and what the pros and cons are of those. We help the client understand where they want to be there. And then the third part is really understanding what we want the name to communicate, because fundamentally names can only really say one or two things off the bat. Obviously, greater meaning is imbued over time. Once you start to build a brand, you develop a logo, perhaps even do advertising, social media, whatever. So the first part of the process is to create that brief, that strategic naming blueprint that does two things. Number one, it gives us a guide back in the office with our creative team to develop names. Second of all, it's the lens through which a client should evaluate a name. Naming is so subjective and it's important that they have a strategic framework to evaluate names. I asked Amanda Peterson, formerly head of naming at Google, what makes a good brief? Here's what she had to say. What are good aspects of briefs are if they're insightful enough to go, actually, we want something that sounds like our competitor because we don't have enough market to build, marketing to build a brand from scratch. Like being honest with the namer about the problems with the product, um, where it's like, Hey, it's really good at X, Y, Z, but it's really terrible at this. So stay away from those stories. You know, a little bit of brand therapy is actually really (laughs) useful for naming. And I would say other names that the stakeholders have thrown around, but I would say some of the best briefs are actually when you write the brief together with the client Mm. and say, okay, what names do you like out there in the market? Is that because of the campaign out there? Do you like the sound of it? Do you, and where the namer themselves actually breaks down uh, and probes the aspects of the name. And Clive Chafer, who's been in naming for over 30 years, including stints at Lexicon and Master McNeil, reminded me why it's so important to get everyone with decision-making power to approve the brief. The single biggest problem with naming, the single biggest thing that goes wrong from anybody's point of view is that somebody in the company, somebody at the client, is not brought into the process early, even though they have veto power over the name. And very often it's somebody down the line who is protecting their boss from getting involved because they don't want them to have to, you know, put time into this. And they're, they're saying, you know, no, 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 he's got, he's got much more important things to think about. We'll handle this. And then they come up with the name and they put it in front of this person who has not been involved. And he looks at it and goes, no. Next up, let's talk about name generation. There were so many great insights here, it's hard to narrow it down to a handful. One interesting point, which I won't play a clip for, is the degree to which everyone I talked to agreed on the amount of time required for name generation. There almost seems to be a four-hour rule, meaning it takes a four-hour uninterrupted block uh, of time to really get into a creative flow. Some people mention shorter times, uh, and of course it depends on the nature of the project, but that four-hour rule seemed to hold across quite a few of the interviews. 
One theme for name generation was simply mixing up the approach. For example, here's Eli Altman, creative director at 100 Monkeys, talking about using online tools versus just sitting and thinking. I, I also think one really important distinction when coming up with names is like whether you're doing that with resources on your computer. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's one way, <laughs> right, to just kind of pour through a bunch of resources, be it, you know, like Wikipedia or, you know, whatever. But um, then there's also just kind of sitting and thinking. Right. And I think it's important to do both of those things on any project um, because they yield vastly different results. Another way to mix up the approach is to work in both groups and individually. Here's Eli Altman again. We definitely do both. Okay. Um, and, you know, depending on the type of project, it, it might sort of be more of one or the other. Um, I think some projects are sort of by nature very research oriented, um, that if you're working on something really, you know, technical or, or specific or with a lot of considerations in play, um, in those situations, we, we tend to sort of go a bit more individually, um, you know, find our angles, do our research, um, you know, and then we'll talk about it throughout the process. I think getting together periodically is, is really important just to check and see where people are and what's working and what isn't. Um, but, you know, then say you're naming like a pizza place or something like that. I, I think, you know, in that case, it's a lot more effective to just kind of throw a bunch of ideas around and see what happens because there isn't this sort of delicate balance of considerations at that point. You can also change your environment to get a new perspective on a project. Shannon DeYoung, CEO of House of Who, talked about the difference between working inside on a computer versus getting outside. Have I been sitting at my computer all day and I'm just now getting to it? Well, opening up an Excel spreadsheet, while it can be very helpful later on with organizing, um, right now is going to just kill my creative mojo. So why don't I grab a pen and paper and my running shoes and walk outside and go for a walk. I mean, so I have even driven before an hour away to a beautiful setting, um, especially when it when it's a particular kind of project, and I need you know more tranquil, kind of open, expansive ideas. And um, given myself physical space and physical beauty um, in order to start unleashing. Shannon also mentioned looking at imagery instead of words, which is a great way of changing the approach. Uh, and she's not the only namer who mentioned it. Here's Scott Milano, uh, managing director at Tange, talking about the same idea. To kind of get away from the language itself uh, or words themselves, one thing that I do is I do like to look at imagery uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of related to the topic that you know we're naming to or the brand that we're naming to or something that's uh, very far removed, but might provide some inspiration in terms of metaphors or moods. This episode is brought to you by squadhelp.com, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. Go to squadhelp.com today to launch your naming contest and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. What about when you get stuck on a naming assignment? I ask namers for tips on how to handle this, and if you listen back to each episode, you'll hear a bunch of great ideas. A few people talked about getting away from the problem to let it marinate, so to speak, in your subconscious. Get some exercise, get some food, get some sleep. All these things can help. But one really interesting idea is trying to name something entirely different. I've heard this called an obscured brief. And if you have a larger team, you could actually do that. You could tell the rest of your team that you're naming something else just to see what they come up with. Anthony Shore, who runs Operative Words, calls this an excursion. Here he is talking about how you can do it, even if you're naming something by yourself. In an excursion, you identify a completely unrelated product category. Sometimes the less related, the better. And you look for examples of a desired attribute or quality from that category. So, for instance, um, if you're naming 
if you're naming a new intelligent form of AI, let's go ahead and consider examples of intelligence from the world of kitchens. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, let's look for ideas of um, uh, intelligence in the world of of sports, right? right? And so, by thinking through an attribute as it appears somewhere else, you are able to find ideas that are differentiated but relevant. Because when you take a word from a different category and drop it into a re relevant category, it immediately becomes relevant to that new category. People are very comfortable with, uh, with this technique. I picked up two great tips on shortlisting during these interviews. The first is from Jonathan Bell. When actually we sit down and do stuff, I take a, like a little sort of, you know, set of index cards and anything we like, we actually write it down and we put it on the table. And I think that tactile way of shortlisting and, and thinking about things, you know, and you can, you know, if someone disagrees, you just take it off the table. It becomes a more interactive um, approach before you start to sort of, you know, craft that, you know, inevitable keynote or PowerPoint presentation. The other shortlisting tip is bringing in people from outside the project to gain a little bit of perspective. Here's Scott Milano again. When it comes time to shortlist, though, uh, one of the things that we're pretty big on is seeking input from a larger group. So it's not just, uh, say, me, the creative director, making some final decisions about, like, which names are going to get into the presentation or what are we going to actually share with the client. I think we all value and think it's important to just to highlight the ones that, that, that individually we think are cool and are moving in the right direction. So we use a bit of, you know, light testing within our, our team itself, sort of like real time testing. When we're working on projects that we know that say that the target audience is a, has a very different perspective, we'll pull from our network of, of, of folks, whether they're pure brand people or artists or creatives or whatever, uh, to provide some input on the names that we're creating. Two episodes from season one are about pre-screening names. I talked to Stephen Price of Tessera Trademark Screening and asked him whether he has any tips for people trying to use the USPTO Trademark Database, or TESS, to search names on their own. Here's what he had to say. Probably start with looking for identical marks as opposed to rotated marks. Identical are, if I'm looking for alpha, it's going to find alpha just the way I've spelt it. Uh, if I can expand to rotated, it's going to look for letter strings of A-L-P-H-A. Um, and just be aware that you can do both of those things. And then you want to probably focus on the most pertinent or most relevant uh, trademark class, that if you're computer software, you're going to pick nine but, and then you're going to have to say, well, I should also look at 42 because that's software that's available only online, not in a package. Um, and just be aware of what the class, the unique classes are. I mean, the relevant classes are. And then mm -hmm. if you can, um, um, restrict the search to particular words that are in the goods and services, such as software or candy bars, um, that too will probably make your search more efficient if you're knocking out the name. So if I did all that and I find Alpha Candy Bar from, you know, Nestle, boom, I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's, it's, it's done. I also talked to Laurel Sutton, a linguistic analysis expert who runs Sutton Strategy. She gave me some detail on how she analyzes data from her linguistic checks to create a report for her clients. When you're testing, you know, 20 names, three people per name in uh, 20 different languages, that's a giant pile of raw data. <laughs> and you have to go through carefully and look at all the responses and say, balance the answer. So if two people think it's good and one people think it's not so good on the pronunciation side, I, I want to delve into that a little bit more and see what they say about why it's difficult to pronounce. The same with the cultural associations. And I always do follow up on it. So if someone says, there's a department store with this name in Tokyo, I go online and I look at the name of the department store and I find out if it's big or small, if there's Yelp reviews that give it a good 
reputation. And then I want to try to put that in the report as well so the client is aware of what that means. It's not enough to say it's the name of a department store in Tokyo. Is it a good department store? Is it premium? Is it high end? What does it actually mean? Right. I want to put it into a report that a client can easily digest. So I will do uh, a page by page for each name, summarizing the highlights and putting in links, clickable links, so they can go and look at the answers. But there's also an executive summary in the front that says, out of those 20 names, here are the ones that I think that you should proceed with. Here are the ones you need to be cautious about for these following reasons. And here are the ones in my opinion, that you should not bother proceeding with for these reasons. Last but certainly not least, a couple of tips on presenting names. Coming up with great ideas is really only half the battle. You've got to help your clients see how these name ideas can propel their brand and their business forward. Here's Jonathan Bell again with some pointers on presenting. Putting together a very powerful presentation where you can build story and rationale for each of the names and why you think they work we tend to develop sort of a just a sort of generic graphic page where we show all the names in the same font, uh, but but sort of surround them with some sort of wallpaper or imagery that reflects what the brand or, or, or company or product is about. We don't develop unique graphic looks for each of the names because I think that 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 serves to distract the client and doesn't you know gets them to focus on the design and not the name. So I'm not a fan of doing that, but. If you can be in person, you you know you've got to see what people's reactions and, and you know body language is critical when you because you can tell if people are engaged and interested yeah. in ideas when you actually you know see them in the flesh. Um, but you know we've done things like you know where we've we've mocked up a business card or we've you know kind of recreated a Wall Street Journal headline and then actually put the name in there. Um, you know by giving a real context to the name. It helps to see it as more than something as just, you know, black type, you know, on, on, on a white page that's seven or eight letters long. And lastly, we'll go back to Eli Altman with a classic reminder uh, on what not to do when presenting names. I, you know, I think anybody who's done this for any amount of time professionally has figured out the, the lesson of like, if you don't like a, a name enough to sort of like be proud of it and share it when the project's done, then don't put it in front of the client. Right. Um, because that's going to be the one that they're going to pick. Well, that's it. That's season one, all wrapped up with a bow. But there are tons of insights and tips on the digital cutting room floor, so be sure to go back and listen to each episode or read through the transcripts on howbrandsarebuilt.com. While you're there, take a look at a blog post called Useful List, online slash software resources used by professional namers. Whenever a namer mentioned a website or some software they use during these interviews, I tried to collect it in a sortable table in that post. So hopefully that's a good resource for you. And I'll keep adding to it as I learn about more tools and resources. Thank you to all of you for listening to season one of How Brands Are Built and to everyone who left a rating or a review or reached out on social media or via the website. If you haven't already subscribed, please do at Apple Podcasts or on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. By subscribing, you can be sure you'll get the first episodes of season two as soon as they come out. Until then, please visit the site for more branding content or contact me with any questions or suggestions. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks again.